اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين for the acceptance of our ziyara, for the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, for the pleasing of the mother of the Imams, Fatima to Zahra, and for the honor of receiving her intercession on the Day of Judgment, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Innama al-mu'minun ikhwah. Sadaq Allahu al-aliyu al-azim. When it comes to ziyarat al-arbi'een, it is truly an extraordinary phenomenon that even those participating in it find it unfathomable, let alone those who don't know what it's about, those who haven't experienced it, those who have not walked from Najaf to Karbala, those who have not seen the hospitality, the gracious nature of the Iraqi people, those who have yet to taste the sweet nectar of stepping into the sacred and majestic mausoleum of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, they will find it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to wrap their heads around what this phenomenon is all about. But even those who do participate, they'll find it extremely difficult as well. And you might ask, well, what's your proof? Surely, like any other phenomena, we should be able to study this, examine it, experience it, and eventually try and make sense of it. What is your proof? Well, the proof is in the words of the one known as As-Sadiq min Ali Muhammad salawatullahi alayhi wa jma'i. The Imam says in a hadith narrated by Ibn Quluwayh al Qummi in his magnum opus, Kamil al Ziyarat. If there are 10 books considered largely authentic and accepted by the vast, overwhelming majority of our scholars as reliable, one of them is Kamil al Ziyarat. This hadith is mentioned there. Imam al Sadiq says to someone, لو يعلم الناس ما في زيارة قبر الحسين عليه السلام. If people knew the nature of the land that they were stepping on, if they knew what was being offered to them, we only see the material banquets that are being presented to us here, but what we don't see is the spiritual banquet. The banquet where the host is Imam al Hussein himself, where the host is Fatima al Zahra and Amir al Mu'mineen. If people understood 
what lied within the visitation of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The Imam says, Lama tu shawqan ilayh. They would have died from yearning to go to Ziyarah, from the joy of knowing where they are. Lama tu. Now, we're not dead, which means we have yet to know. We don't get it, we don't understand. We only see the facade, we only see a small glimmer of this infinitely bright supernova that is Abu Abdullah al Hussein and his ziyara. We still don't understand it. Books, articles, theses, entire treaties have been devoted to trying to make sense of the ziyara of Imam al Hussein, not just Imam al Hussein himself or his movement or his objectives or his goals or what he did on the day of Ashura, but the ziyara itself. It's unfathomable, it's incomprehensible. I'll give you another hadith once again in Kamil al Ziyarat. Imam al Sadiq says, Ma min nabiyin lillahi fi samawat. There is not a prophet of God in the heavens, given that all of the prophets either died or were killed or were raised. Like Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he was raised. He's awaiting the return of the Savior in the fourth heaven. And when the Savior, savior returns, Rasulullah has famously declared, not only in our traditions, but also in the traditions of the opposing camp, that he will pray behind the son of Fatima to Zahra. He will pray behind a member of this nation, a member of this holy household. So all the prophets are in the heavens. Imam al-Sadiq says, مَا مِن نَبِيٍ لِلَّهِ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ إِلَّا وَيَسْتَأْذِنُ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فِي زِيَارَةِ الْحُسَيْنِ Every prophet begs Allah, prays to God to be granted permission to come and visit Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. The Imam then adds, he says, فَفَوْجٌ يَنزِلْ وَفَوْجٌ يَصْعَدْ Fawj means like a group, right? You have these groups that come to Ziyara. The prophets also form groups. The Imam says that a group of prophets descend and a group of prophets ascends. Now, with a visitation like this, with a phenomenon like this, where you see a human avalanche, a human avalanche, that head towards the head, the peak of this mountain, that is Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It goes the other way around. Such a phenomenon is unfathomable. We don't get it. However, attempts have been made. Many books have been authored. Many scholars, the most brilliant minds have tried to extrapolate meaning, to extrapolate lessons from this visitation. And they've talked about various aspects of it. They've talked about the spiritual dimensions of the ziyarah. They've talked about the geopolitical ramifications of the ziyarah. There's an entire discussion as to how the Imams carefully calculated and planned the ziyarah in such a manner so as to create a geography for their followers. Imagine if we were just dispersed throughout the world. Imagine if we didn't have places that we were constantly connected to. We formed a geographical weight in the world thanks to these ziyarat. And so these discussions have been made. But what I want to talk about tonight in the brief time that I have is the social dimension of ziyarah. Or to be more precise, the socio-educational dimension of the ziyarah. And in order to address this topic, I want to start by asking you all a question that I want you to think about and maybe perhaps provide an answer to in your own mind. And my question is this, at your very core, who are you? How do you define your identity? What is your identity? Because there is a plethora of ways that you can identify yourself. You can identify yourself by your race. Many people do that. You can identify yourself by your ethnicity. 
You can identify yourself by your nationality. You can identify yourself by your class, socioeconomic class. You can identify yourself by your tribal affiliations. You can identify yourself by your job. You can identify yourself, that is, by your career. And so there's a plethora, an endless array of different selections that you can make in formulating an identity for yourself. However, notice how the verse that I recited at the beginning, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He says that there is a brotherhood. Obviously, there are all kinds of brotherhoods, again, because in the Quran, there is no specific term that refers to identity, right? Instead, what we have is ukhuwa. For instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who are extravagant and wasteful, they are brothers to who? To the demons. So there is instantly a fraternity, a brotherhood created. In other words, if you engage in, in these acts, if you exhibit these attributes, then you are automatically uh, introduced or induced rather within the fraternity of demons. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this example in order to make us apprehensive towards these actions, right? You're supposed to be repulsed. You're supposed to feel like, I don't want to be a part of this posse, a part of this fraternity. I'm a good person. I'm not a demon, right? Think about the fact that this rainbow spectrum that's been gaining more and more prominence and strength over the last couple of decades, right? That's a fraternity. That's a brotherhood. Even though the various disparate groups within the, rain the rainbow coalition share little more than their desire to completely upend society's moral fabric. They don't share much in common between themselves, but that is a shared goal. And so they think of themselves as a fraternity. That's why they have a shared logo, a shared emblem, a shared uh, set of objectives. They demand recognition, they demand acceptance. In fact, their slogan is toward 100% acceptance. In other words, if there is one single person in society who refuses to accept us, we will not rest until that person concedes, until that individual surrenders to our will. He or she has to accept us for who we are. And so that's a fraternity, that's a brotherhood. But notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse that I recited, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Innama in the Arabic language denotes exclusivity. In other words, the only brotherhood is that of the believers. Al Mu'minun Ikhwa. And they're the only brotherhood. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that? Despite the fact that we have all kinds of brotherhoods, as we explained, depending on how you identify yourself, depending on how you define your identity. What this means is that the only brotherhood, the only fraternity that receives divine backing and recognition and has legitimacy in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? The brotherhood that revolves around faith. The brotherhood that's grounded in belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His prophets, His messengers and his values. This is the only true identity. Every other marker of identity that's not based on this or stems from it is not only worthless, but is detrimental to us. It's a seed that grows nothing but vitriol and hatred. In other words, my Arabic ethnicity or language or nationality is completely worthless unless it is grounded on and based on what? On my religious identity. Whether I'm an Arab, Persian, Turk, Khoja, it doesn't matter. It's all worthless. It's all worthless. And one of the great lessons that we learn from Ziyaratul Arba'een is exactly that. You've seen 
how every other marker, every other means of defining an identity is completely dissolved. When you make the walk, when you're on your pilgrimage towards Karbala, none of that matters. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're Arab or non-Arab, nobody even asks you about that unless they're curious. Unless they want to feel proud of the fact that we have so many different identities all melting in this pot that we call Arba'een. Every single ethnicity, every single class, every single language, every single barrier completely gets torn down in favor of the one and only legitimate shared identity that we all have, which is the one that is grounded in our love for Imam al Hussein, meaning faith, meaning belief. And really, there is no other place around the world. I'm, I stand to be challenged. I would love for anyone who has an opinion that counters this to come up to me, approach me and tell me that I'm wrong. Nowhere else on the entire planet, in fact, the entire universe, do you find a shared sense of brotherhood than in Arba'in. There's nothing like it. This is one of the greatest lessons that we learn from this. That in order for us to define our identity in a world that is marred by a crisis of identity, by an identity recession. People talk about economic res recession. The biggest recession that we're suffering from in this day and age is in our identity. Who are you? Once again, I ask. Because a lot of times we find ourselves creating different metrics for our identity that are detrimental, like I said, that are divisive, that are wrong and downright immoral. We live in an age where a Muslim feels ashamed of defining him or herself as a Shia of Aba Abdullah and Hussein. We're ashamed of that. We're ashamed of praying in public in a place where we are a minority because you will instantaneously be identified as a Muslim. We're ashamed of telling our co-workers at, at, at work that we are Muslims, that we have our own values and principles and we'd like to live by those principles. But why? My brothers and sisters, if we're going to take a lesson from this ziyara, and there are many lessons to read, but one of the most important ones is this, when you go back home, wherever that may be, whether you live in Australia, the UK, New Zealand, America, wherever it may be, especially in places where you are a minority, where you have every disincentive to detach yourself from that identity. Remember the fact that we should be proud of our faith. There's nothing in our faith that is shameful. There is nothing in our faith that would push us to hiding who we actually are, despite the fact that you see other conservative communities like Jews and Hindus and others, they walk around with pride, despite lacking the illustrious and beautiful examples that we have like the Ahlul Bayt. Who has a personality that is as great as Rasulullah? Who has exemplars like Imam al Hussein, like Abu al Fadl al Abbas, like Ali al Akbar, or even the companions of Imam al Hussein? Why are we ashamed of our identity? And again, this shame doesn't necessarily have to translate in me saying, I'm ashamed of being a Shia Muslim, but it's the little things, it's the nuances, right? It's how you conduct yourself. It's the fact that our sisters feel this sense of pressure to take off the hijab or loosen the hijab. Or it's the fact that the brothers feel an, an urge or a, a push to assimilate you know, quote unquote, assimilate within their respective cultures. Why? Don't think of your faith, your values, your religion, your leaders as some kind of burden that you have to carry on your shoulder. Think of them as a badge of honor. In Karbala, we all feel like this. In Karbala, when you visit the shrine of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, how do you feel? When you see millions upon millions of people visiting his shrine, 
some crawling, others finding it difficult to walk, blisters in your feet, all these things. All the challenges that they face, heading towards the very spring of life. أَشْهَدُ أَنَّكَ قُتِلْتَ وَلَمْ تَمُتْ بَلْ بِرَجَاءِ حَيَاتِكَ حَيَّتْ قُلُوبُ شِيَعَتِكَ you really feel it here in Karbala that your life is dependent on Imam Al Hussein. That Aba Abdullah radiates with true life, not biological life, where cells interact in a chemical manner. But true life can only be derived from the shrine of Aba Abdullah, from the remembrance of Imam Al Hussein. You all feel that. When you see people of different nationalities, ethnicities, languages, classes, when you see all of them, sometimes you see them represented by their national flag, right? And you would be hard pressed to find a flag that's missing, right? Most of the flags are represented. I'm not in favor of this, but at the end of the day, some people might like to show how every national country is represented in Karbala, so be it. You see all of this and you feel what? You feel pride. Not the negative kind of pride, by the way. Not self-confidence, but you feel that you're a member of a formidable fraternity. You're a member of a global community of devotees to the most pristine values, to the most beautiful examples, to the very embodiment of virtue. The Ahlul Bayt, may God's peace and blessings be upon them. You feel this. A lot of times I tell my brothers and sisters when I talk to them that one of our biggest problems, one of the most difficult challenges that we face today is our lack of pride and confidence in our faith. Whereas if you look at the number of Shia around the world, if I asked you right now, can you point to the country known as Trinidad on a map. How many of you can pick it out? Where is Trinidad? Most people don't even know where it is. It's in the Caribbean, right? Well, what about Trinidad? In 1888, the Muslim community in Trinidad, it's a small series of islands, an archipelago. In 1888, the British had colonized these islands. And they had brought in, they had natives and they had Indians and they had different people there. And the British colonizers realized that there is a period of 10 days every year where the Muslim community, which was a minority, and the Shia were even a smaller minority. There is a 10 day period where they come out, they carry replicas of shrines. Even they didn't even know what this was. All they knew was that this period is called Jose. Right? Jose. What is it? What does it stand for? Even they had no clue. An actual Trinidadian told me this. He said, we would come out. It was a 10 day thing. We would cry. We would mourn. We would lament. But we had no clue what this was about. So the British colonizers did what they do best, which is ban this. Why? Because they had these slaves who worked on these fields and so they didn't want them to stop working for 10 days and so they said we're going to put a ban on this procession, this Jose procession. You can look this up online by the way, there's a lot of articles written about it. And so for the first couple of years the Muslim community, which by the way includes both the Shia and the Sunni, they didn't come out because the persecution was too great. They're slaves after all, they would be killed. They're, they didn't hold any rights of any kind. And so a couple of years after that, the British governor had left for London. And so they decided to leave the plantations on the first of Muharram. They had made plans that on the first of Muharram, we're gonna leave the plantations, we're gonna leave the fields, and we're going to come out and carry these mausoleum replicas, which they had spent an entire year building. And so sure enough, they come out, and on the 10th of Muharram, the British decide to massacre them.
They killed dozens of them, which is now called the Muharram Massacre. The British call it the Jose Riots. But the people in Trinidad and Tobago, they call it the Muharram Massacre. And that became the beginning of a revolution against who? The British colonizers. Brothers and sisters, we belong to this community. We belong to a community where blood relations don't matter unless they stem from our religious fraternity. Think of the two brothers on the plains of Karbala, Amr ibn Qarada al-Ansari and his brother Ali ibn Qarada al-Ansari. Their father was a companion of, of, of Amir al-Mu'mineen wa shahada ma'ahu hurubahu thalatha. Their father was a devout and loyal companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He participated in all three major wars of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And yet these two brothers who grew up in the same household, they shared their DNA. Ali ibn Qarada ends up in the camp of Umar ibn Sa'd, whereas Amr ibn Qarada ends up in the camp of Imam al Hussein. Historians describe Amr ibn Qarada, the companion of Imam al Hussein. They say, Lam yusib Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam ta'natan wala darbatan ma dama kana hayya. As long as he was alive, Imam al Hussein wasn't injured. This is a common theme that you find among many of the companions of Imam al Hussein. They would shield their Imam with their faces. Imagine an arrow that's like a meter, a meter and a half in length. It's more destructive than a bullet approaching you. An entire rain of arrows and you block them with your face. You shield them with your chest and your neck. He was in the camp of Imam al Hussein. Is there a brotherhood that is closer than that of two blood brothers? There isn't. And yet, this is worthless unless the brotherhood was bound by something much stronger. The only thing, in fact, that is sanctioned and validated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innama al mu'minuna ikhwah. The companions of Imam al-Hussein, they shared little amongst each other. Think of the fact that you had people who didn't even speak the same language. You had Salim al-Ghulam al-Turki. He had learned Arabic as a second language and he was a scribe for Imam al-Hussein. But his native language, his native tongue wasn't even Arabic. What does he share with Habib ibn Mudahir? What does John the slave share with Muslim ibn Awsajah? What does Sa'id ibn Abdullah al-Hanafi share with al-Hurr ibn Yazid al-Riyahi? What does al-Hafaf ibn al-Muhannad share with Abbas ibn Shabib al-Shakiri? Nothing. The only thing that they shared, which was the strongest bond imaginable, was their love and devotion to Aba Abdullah al Hussein, such that when we you when you and I visit them, we say, Assalamu alaikum ya ansara Rasulillah. Bi abi antum wa ummi. May my parents be ransomed for you. I would see my parents die before you. Who? Not Imam al Hussein, but his slaves, his companions, the people that joined him halfway towards Karbala. Who were these people? What bound them together? The only thing that could bind them in such an inseparable way was their shared religious identity, their faith, their devotion. And that, brothers and sisters, is the lesson we should all take home. That as long as this person shares your love for Imam al Hussein, that's what we say in Ziyarat Ashura, that's what we say in Ziyarat al Jama'ah, that's what we say in so many of other, uh, our, our other devotional literature. Silmun liman salamakum, harbun liman harabakum. I am at peace with whoever is at peace with you, Ya Aba Abdullah. I don't care who he is, where he comes from, what language, what, none of that matters. And I am at war with whoever is at war with you, even if it's my own blood brother. Like Ali ibn Qarada. When Amr ibn Qarada was killed, Ali ibn Qarada, who was, as I said, in the camp of Umar ibn Sa'd, he came to him, came to the Imam. 
And he said to him, you killed my brother, by God I shall kill you. The Imam said to him, I didn't kill your brother. Allah wanted what is best for your brother. Your brother knew what he was doing. Your brother knew that he was on a path of salvation like no other. See the difference? That should be the only metric, the only thing that defines who I am as a believer. I mentioned Al Hafaf ibn al Muhannad. He was the last martyr on the plains of Karbala. I love to mention him because he was unique and different from all of the other companions. Think of the fact that all the other companions, they fought with the hope of trying to save the life of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. That was their aim, that was their objective. Not only that, so they had hope. The other point is that they were fighting while Imam al Hussein cheered them on. They were fighting while keeping a close eye onto the luminous, beautiful face of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. They had Imam al Hussein inspire them and radiate towards them with life, with energy. And so Imam al Hussein was there while they fought. And yet, Al Hafaf ibn al Muhannad al Basri, when he arrived, he had heard that Imam al Hussein was on his way towards Kufa. The messages of the Imam had reached him, but by the time he arrived in Karbala, the chants of Allahu Akbar, Laqad Qatalna al Hussein were already arising, meaning we have killed Hussein. Imam al Hussein was gone. Imagine he's arrived. A little too late. The Imam has already been killed. Does he go back? Does he flee? Does he run away? Absolutely not. He calls the enemy. He summons the forces, 30,000 of them. He says to them, Ya ayyuhal jundul mujannad, ana al hafhaf ibn al muhannad. What is my job? What is my objective? Ahmi ayalat Muhammad. I am here to defend the family of Rasulullah. Even if you've killed Imam al Hussein, I will give my every last breath in defense of his family because he could see the unthinkable about to unfold. He could see the entire enemy camp converging on the tents of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. So he charged into the battlefield. He fought with them single handedly until he was killed. This is, is what should bind us all together, brothers and sisters. Finally, the very epitome of our shared values, our shared identity is summarized in the words of Amr ibn Janad. He's this young boy who comes to Abu Abdullah al Hussein and he says to him, Ya Abu Abdullah, would you give me permission to go and fight? You've all heard the story. Imam al Hussein looks at this young boy with sympathy. He says, this young boy's father, Junada, has just been killed in battle. Take him back to his mother. His mother doesn't want to see him die. So he says to the Imam, it was my mother who brought me here. It was my mother who had me wear my armor. Ya Aba Abdullah, my mother can't face your mother Fatima to Zahra on the day of judgment. Fatima having lost her son, and I haven't lost my son. I have to offer some sacrifice in your way. It was my mother who sent me. So Imam al Hussein cries for him. He blesses him and his mother and his father. He then grants him his blessing to head into the battlefield. He heads into the battlefield reciting these epic poems. We should all memorize this because one day we will be lowered into our graves. The angels will come and say, Man Rabbuk, Man Nabiyuk, Man Imamuk, who are you? We have to have a response to offer to them that is satisfactory. We should say what Amr ibn Janada says. He didn't identify himself by his name or his tribe. What did he say? He said, Amir Hussein wa Ne'mal Amir Fuadil Bashir al-Nadir Ali wa 
فاطمة والدا فهل تعلمون له من نظير He says don't worry about my name or my tribe's name My master is Hussein and what a great master he is Allahu Akbar, ya mu'mineen, we're all here in Karbala. You should know that every square inch of this land has seen unspeakable tragedies. When Imam Zainul Abideen and Ziyarat al Arbi'een is about Imam Zainul Abideen. When the Imam said to his aunt and the women, Alaykunna bil firar, what do we do, O oh son of my brother? Lady Zainab asked the Imam, the enemy is approaching, they have torches of fire in their hands. Where do we go? The Imam said to them, you have to flee in the desert. Which desert? It was the land that we're sitting on right now. This is where the women and children were running in no specific direction. Ajarakallah, baqiyat Allah. Imam Zainul Abideen is now coming towards Karbala. In only two days, the Imam will arrive on this land. His tragedies will be revived. When the Imam came to Karbala, he then devoted his life towards what? Towards making sure people remember the tragedy of Abu Abdullah and what happened to them, which is why. Why Imam Zain al Abideen would try and give hints as to what they did to his father without opening up the tragedy too much. And the Imam would walk in the marketplace. If he saw a butcher about to be about to slaughter a sheep, the Imam would approach him. You all know that Imam al Rida said to Ibn Shabib, Rayyan ibn Shabib, he said to him, If you're gonna cry, for anyone فَبْكِ لِجَدِّي الْحُسَيْنِ فَإِنَّهُ ذُبِحَ كَمَا يُذْبَحُ الْكَابِ For he was killed like a sheep and there are similarities between how they killed Abu Abdullah and how a sheep is slaughtered. But Imam Zain al-Abideen wants to remind us of the opposite of that. That the way a sheep is slaughtered is much more humane and merciful. He would go to these butchers. He would say, stop before you slaughter the sheep. Did you quench its thirst? Did you offer it some water? Now imagine what the butchers would say in response they would say Ibn Rasulullah of course we did we have learned this from you and your forefathers we would never slaughter a sheep without giving it some water first our sheep don't die while thirsty they would say Ibn Rasulullah we also have other etiquette Ajarakallah Baqiyat Allah Ya Ibn Rasulillah, when we want to slaughter a sheep, we make sure we use a sharp blade so it doesn't suffer. Ya Ibn Rasulillah, Ya Zain al Abideen, when we slaughter a sheep, we cut the jugular veins from the front so the blood gushes out and it dies quickly. We never slaughter the sheep from the back or the neck. Ya Ibn Rasulillah, this is even more painful. When we slaughter a sheep, we make sure its children aren't watching as we do that. We make sure the calves are removed and isolated for the reappearance of Imam Zaman saying, Wa Husayna!